Go. It's your boy Eddie Bryant and Nikki Moore is here and you are tuned in to Backstage Beyond the Laughs. Uh, we have a great show set up for you this week, man. We got a lot going on. Hi, Nikki. How are you? Hey, Eddie B. Favorite funny man. How you doing? Happy. Uh, well, when you guys hear this uh, broadcast, it will be Nikki's birthday. Happy belated <gasps> birthday. Yay. She Thank is, you. She is 75 all over again. No, I'm teasing. No, I make like 75. Look good. <laughs> yes, you do. Looking yes. fabulous. Yes. I love it. So we are celebrating our birthday, among other things. Yes, we are. Um, yes, we are. We had a lot of things going on this week. Quite a lot. Uh, the NAACP Awards was phenomenal. Right. Um, they really did it big this year. They broadcast. Uh, Hi, Jeff. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> officially on BET. Yes. And they also did a simulcast on seven or eight other networks yeah. comedy central that was different yeah very that different. was different that was like something super new for them right yeah, definitely new so it was like on what tv one was one of them yes. was tv one one uh yes i believe tv one b no bt comedy central lifetime uh smithsonian Smithsonian. Yeah, they had the Smithsonian. Ooh, um, it, it was a network. There's doubt. Yeah, so it was a whole. It was an entire a lot of a lot of different things. Um, one of the biggest take takeaways was Jill Scott's performance, and it made me hot and bothered. Did it? Yes. Because her boobs. Jilly, uh, Jilly that cleavage Philly was fire, though. Yeah. That cleavage was like. Mm -hmm. Tell you something, Jilly from Philly. If you ever listen hey, to man. this, I want to take you out, and uh, is this the way? That's all I want to know. <laughs> and um, let's see. Also, my other wife, uh, Rihanna, uh, who I okay. love tremendously with yeah. my whole being. She is just like uh, a big ball of fire and inspiration. <sighs> did you see her speech? I did not. Oh, uh, man. She, um, you know, she she's really, she is enlightened. I did, however, see Jill's uh, performance. Oh, you saw Jill's performance. O M, yes, indeed. To the G. Yeah, Jill was Jill was definitely yeah, like that. Jill killed it. Uh, but Rihanna is. I mean, most most black entertainers are dope though. Right now, like there's not a lot of. Uh, so you think Lil Boosie is enlightened? He, no, I said entertainers. <laughs> Boosie not, is an entertainer. Not to me. Oh, Lord. Sorry. Here we go. Not to me. Not, not to me. Now he's not an entertainer. Who is that, as a matter of fact? What? Little, little Boots? Who? Oh, man. Got, Come yeah, on, Nikki. No, he's not. I got he's video not. of you twerking a little Boosie. I don't think so. Okay, wait. EBay. What's his song, though? It could be It could be true. <laughs> it could be true. What's his song? You a bad, bad. You a bad, bad. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, so you butt recognized it before you did. It could have been me. I felt it. Look. It could have been me. Cut it out. Cut okay. it out. Okay. 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 Boom. Okay. So, you know. Um, I just didn't know that was it. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, let me just not say all black entertainers. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm going to change that to most. Yeah. A lot, yeah. But Rihanna uh, is really vocal about, um, she was making a point that, yeah. you know, we do business with uh, our Caucasian counterparts. And... That. Um, you know, when we're going through something as a community, they want to do business with us. They're our, they're our friends. Yeah. Uh, they're in our families. Yeah. And so when we're going through something, they need you to pull up. You know how I feel about you this, know what Eddie. I mean? so, so we need to, you know, pull you up. You know how I feel about this. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I think that loyalty is probably the most or least, least valued character yeah. or characteristic in the black community we have none no no we'll we we, we will get some we um, need to get some the asians they spend their money together they do business together they pass their businesses on they create their own banks they they only bank with other asians and we mm -hmm. can't even be loyal to our hairdos we only like go to the beauty supply at the Chinese store. Well, they I, treat us bad. They spit on us. Well, I think they that beat up our girls. Ho, 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 ho. I think that narrative is changing. There are a lot mm -hmm. of, I've seen a, a, a black woman's um, website where uh, Serena is one of the part owners okay. where uh, you buy the uh, unit. I guess that's what y'all call it. You buy the unit that's from weird. them. That's a weird white people. Right? And they will connect you with a uh person to put it on 
in your market for that fee. So you don't have to go around looking for somebody to do wow. something. Anyway, so uh, it was a lot of other things going on. Deontay Wilder, uh, that fight was, I mean, nobody was ready for that. It was, bad. It was really bad. I, I don't want to talk about it. But we have a Can dynamite. Beat up though? I, we're going to talk about it. Can we bit. call it beat up? No, it's not beat up because what, I think, that, I think he it? cheated. Um, he I think fear, I think he he got, I, I think. Uh, did you see the video with... I did not. Okay, I, sh- I will talk no, about I did it. Not. Um, we have a guest this week. We do. Um, uh, wonderful guest. I want him, Shane, to uh, kind of bring him on. Okay. Um, this guy right here is one of uh, a comedy icon in the making. Uh, writer, comedian, actor, producer, uh, very good friend of mine. Uh, you've seen him on Martin Lawrence First Amendment, the original <laughs> HBO Def Comedy Jam, uh, Robert Townsend's Partners in Crime, Unsung Hollywood. I mean, the list goes on and on. None other than Daryl Littleton, aka D. D- Oh, whoa, all that. Thank you for all that love. Right. What's happening, <laughs> brother? I'm finally here. Yes. Welcome yes, to it's good party. to be here. You know what I mean? Thank you for uh, joining us this week, brother. We really appreciate hey. it. Thank you um, for calling me, Eddie. Thanks for having me on, Nikki. Nada. You're welcome. Nah. D, where are you? It's so sunny and bright. Are you in I am in Los Angeles. I was I was in a darker environment when I tried to call you early. That was probably it. The sunshine, the solar oh, thing. I, I'm in LA. So uh, they say it's about 85 say, degrees. I thought you was gonna wow. say you was over Michael Blackson's family house. All we saw was a <laughs> We ain't see nothing. <laughs> you Gee, it's so Nothing darker, yeah. Yeah, uh, Michael's just uh, half a shade lighter than Al Toomer. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So, so for those who are unfamiliar, you need to get in the loop. Uh, yeah. Daryl Littleton is just like one of the uh, one of the hardest working men in comedy. Like he's dedicated to the craft day one. Um, you've heard him on the Tom Jordan Morning Show. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. He was a original writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, he landed the executive uh, writing position when D- uh, D.L. Hughley was hosting Comic View. My favorite human. Yeah, that's right. And uh, also worked with Cedric Entertainer, some more, Don D.C. Carey. Uh, like I said, Robert Townsend, mm-hmm. which is one of my favorite uh, uh, business people in this business. You know, I really love his attitude. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of things that's going on in comedy, going on with Daryl, so that y'all can support and get to know him. Mm-hmm. All right, so D, how yes. did it all begin from you? Where, you, where, tell the people where you're from. How did you get started in comedy? Uh, from LA, grew up in LA. I thought I was going to be a, a trumpet player all my life and not even be in the United States right now. That was the goal, that was the plan. Right, you and, got to uh, play a hat now. <laughs> uh, disco came in. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty good, but uh, disco came in, and uh, that's how old I am. I don't mind being old. You know, well, I ain't old. I just live a lot. That's okay. right. That's all right. right. That, that's how that is. We all trying to get to the old club. I'm trying to get older. Um, right. But disco came in, and then I had to find something else to do. I did sales for a, a while. I was good at that, but I didn't really like, you know, I didn't care about nobody putting a roof on their house and sending their kid to school. And uh, so I would get the job done, but I wasn't making no friends. Right. Um, and then I figured, well, in comedy, I was funny. So I got into that. I got what happened was I got married. Uh, my wife and her her mother and my mother in law and father in law got kicked out of their place, and uh, my mother in law wanted to come stay with us. And so my mother in law came, stayed with us. My wife was pregnant, wow. and I had to get out of the house at night. So that's how I got into comedy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It was crowded in there. Hey, you know yeah. what? Yeah. 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 Too, I didn't want to hear about your sewing stories and all. Oh, that. But, story. yes. <laughs> You just needed some peace. He's like, I'm going to go sleep at the comedy club. I'm with that. Hey, it was hey. a lot more fun. I couldn't sing, so I couldn't say, well, I'm going out and do some cabaret stuff. So, yeah, comedy. Yeah. That was yeah. the way out. Oh, 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 comedy, huh? You going to leave me in where, here? Where did you first do comedy? The first place I did comedy was Marla Gibbs Memory Lane. Um, wow. Marla Gibbs had a club uh South Central L.A. on uh, King Boulevard. Marla Gibbs from Jefferson's? Great Marla Gibbs, yeah. Wow. She is a phenomenal person. So did she do stand-up? Once a week. You used to do that once a week? No, she didn't do stand-up. 
No, she, she was, was never. She actress. was always an actress. She was just no, she was an had, actress who could do comedy. She wasn't necessarily a comedy actress, really. Right, right, right. We had um, Hal Williams on here, who okay. was uh, one of the writers for Two Two Seven and a good friend of Marla Gibbs. Okay, yeah. So I met him one time. Good guy. Good guy. So let's let's okay. So you so you started out, and that was in L.A. That was in L.A. And the first time I went up, I had uh -huh. a very good show. The host sounded like Lou Rawls. And nobody had even pointed that out. So I went up there and said, you know, he introduced me. I said, give it up for Lou Rawls. Got my first laugh. And then everything was cool until I did my third show. Um, I did my third show at the Comedy Act Theater. Robin Harris was the host. Uh -huh. And the first Comedy comic Act. up was Martin Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're both heavy hitters. The mm -hmm. third comic up was me. I mean, you know, the comic right after Martin was me, because when I called him up, I said, hey, you know, I'm a comedian. I want to see if I can do some time. And they said, yeah, come up to the show Thursday night. Uh, he didn't vet me at all. He didn't say, well, how long have you been doing comedy or nothing like that? I had no business on that stage at that time. And the place was packed. Everybody was there. Uh, Denzel was there. Wesley Snipes was there. Lake, Lake, uh, Tyson was there. Magic yeah. Johnson was there. Michael Cooper was there. Oh, the, the whole bunch of athletes, a whole bunch of celebrities. And... Um, I went up there and bombed. <laughs> I was, wow. I'd only been doing comedy three times, and I didn't have the Lou Rawls joke to open me up with. So wow. I went up there, and Robin Harris talked about me like a dog. And I wanted to leave. <laughs> you know, my, my first reaction was, okay, as soon as I get off the stage, uh, I'm going to grab my woman, and we're walking out the door, and she would not let me go. She said, no, nah, you're going to have to ride it through. You say you want to be a comedian. This is going to probably be the bad part. And... Uh, <laughs> sat there and Robin roasted me, like I said, for about 10, 15 minutes. But then after that, you know, you can still feel people looking at you. But uh, after that, they brought up the next comic. The next comic didn't say nothing about me. And so I, I was kind of forgotten. And then I realized, you know, people might talk about the next day, but they don't know you from Adam. And then I got better and better. And then I saw how the public is. If you're a winner, public don't care about when you lost. Yeah. And that's comedy. Every every night or every time you go up, you have another chance to win. That's right. That's right. Your so first, did you, I'm sorry, okay. go ahead. I was just a follow up. Okay. At that at that point, did you what did you have the persona of D Militant? Or no. you were just <laughs> no. Daryl Littleton. I was Daryl Littleton. I was working at a mortgage company. So I was wearing silk suits and ties and I did I was talking but it looked like a guy that should be upset about anything. And that's when I learned about uh, stage persona. Okay. Um, you have to go up there with something that an audience can grab onto right off the bat. If you're a fat person, you automatically got an in because you can talk about that. Tall, skinny, funny looking, whatever. Um, you got to stake your identity pretty quick with an audience. If you don't physically look the part, the audience can get kind of confused on what you're talking about. Hmm. Okay. I got a question. Shoot. Your, you had your first comedy CD, Am I Living? What was the inspiration? Am I Lying? Am I Lying? Yeah, yeah. You, you oh, probably got the bootleg version where they wrote it in quotes. <laughs> Am I Lying? Okay. Am I Lying? Yes. Yeah. What was the inspiration for that? Um, Just, I would say it on stage. I would, do, I would do a joke and then it would get, you know, because I was hitting hard when I finally got the persona. And uh, as a matter of fact, Ronaldo Ray told me the first mm -hmm. time I did, he said, now that's your act. That's what you do from now on. Mm -hmm. So I was hitting and then some people were kind of like, whoa. And I would be like, what, am I lying? Ah, okay. And so that naturally okay. became the name of that CD. That became your hook, your stick. That was the hook. So to speak. The, okay. fir the first time I experienced your stand-up was on the Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, you had a feature set on there. You weren't on open, um, open mic like the amateur night, right? You had a, no. You were you were no. a featured comedian, right? And it was so pro black, right? And so, you know, th it's only fitting that we end Black History Month this way. So, how? What was your passion for 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 being pro black? How did you? Um, have the courage to implement that in your stand-up, especially coming out of L.A. where a lot of cats 
in my, you know, they, you know, they are definitely trying to appeal to the mainstream. And you just was like, I'm gonna go against from from where I stood, it was like, I'm going against the grain. I'm gonna be unapologetically black. Love you, yeah. leave me alone. Um, and I've heard this a lot, the word courage. Some stuff is just kind of natural. Uh, I've always talked trash. Uh, when I worked at the mortgage company, when Martin Luther King holiday came around, they were telling us, well, y'all got to work. And I went to the head guy without thinking about it, really, and said, well, I'm not going to work that day. And uh, I don't expect to get fired. I'm your top salesman. And bottom line is, if you try to fire me, I'll probably sue the company because it's a national holiday. So how are you going to make us work? Hmm. And then he saw my point. And just made a memo and put it out there. No, nah, nobody's going to work. Uh, because my thing about being pro-black is my dad raised me. The first album I ever saw in life was a Dick Gregory album. So I came up on Dick Gregory. My dad wasn't a Muslim, but he got final calls all the time. Uh, big fan. We had Malcolm X albums. Those were playing all the time. So it was kind of upbringing the kind of way I was raised to you're a black man. Why would you think? think you're less than anybody else when evidence does not even point that out. Um, everywhere I went, I was able to excel. I don't care if I was around Asians, white, Hispanic, it really didn't matter. Right. Um, not just on a mental thing as far as doing work and all that, but even though I was small, I was able to scrap with the best of them because my thing was, and I'll say it, I never thought black people at any point because of the brainwashing, they try to make you feel inferior well, if we look at it pound for pound, if you let us in stuff, then we show a certain amount of superiority. Right. So I never, give you a quick story. Mitzi Shore at the comedy store, and I wanted to get in the comedy store. Um, she finally let me in. And the first thing she said was, I like your act. You're real funny. I'm going to blow you up. I'm going to make you a star. And I like whoopsie wooly. And I said, huh? And she said, I like Whoopsie Wooly. That's what we're going to call you. We're going to call you Whoopsie Wooly. <laughs> that was your I'm name. Thinking, you ain't going to call me no dog on Whoopsie Wooly. Uh, that sounds like a coon. That sounds like a brother shining shoes and you yeah. know, uh, so polishing she rags name, or something. Or name you Whoopsie she Wooly. tried to name you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was already D Miller Town. I was all, had already been on the radio. I had just come back from doing a tour overseas with uh, Doug Stanhope. This was in the early 90s. So I had just done 14 military bases. Wow. So it wasn't like I was an unknown or no, uh, nobody. I had already done, I think, um, one TV shot. Might have been a comic view at that okay. point. Okay. Yeah, and she wanted to call me Whoopsie. And I was telling her, well, I have a, I have a stage name. I have a stage persona. You saw it up there on the stage, uh, D. Miller Todd. And she's saying, yeah, but uh, I like Whoopsie Willie. <laughs> and I know a lot of brothers would have said, well, if you like Whoopsie Willie, I like it too. I like and it too. they'd have had their own TV show. They probably had a five-picture movie deal. But when the Whoopsie Willie thing faded out, they would have been similar to Stephen Fetchett or Mantan Moore. If you want to get even closer to history, Jimmy yeah. Walker. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Now, whose story is like crazy to me. because Ooh, Jimmy? Yeah, because... Uh, Leno and Letterman were writing for him. They were, you know what I mean? And to look at their career over that time period and look at his career over that time period. Right. You know, a uh, couple of movies to 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 speak of. No, he's a Trump supporter. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, yeah. I wasn't even going to get into that. I want to say the F word, but <laughs> I'll just move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. So you have some real, like, real impressive credits. I Thank was you. looking at your uh, information. You've written six books. That's not even. Uh, no, wait, wait, wait. You, you, boy, you got the old information. Right. Nah, this is who is this? I, I you was... gave me the wrong. <laughs> Hold on now. Hold on. This is book right here. This is book. There we are. This is book number eight. I have that you published six books, so eight books. Okay, I got eight books. So she stopped. She ain't go far enough. Well, he just released. He okay. just released. I just released the book. This day in comedy. This day this in day comedy. This day in comedy. I see that you uh, one broke activist. The Adventures of D. Militon. Now that's my graphic novel, which does not count as my book. So okay. I got nine publications, one comic book, and uh, eight books. So what's books. the difference? What is a graphic novel? A graphic novel is like a comic book. 
Okay. I wish I had a copy for you. It's only like uh what 20, 30 pages, something like that. Okay, okay. Yeah. You and I did a comic book about Donald Trump, and at the end of it, uh, I'm hunting Donald Trump, you know, like a Nazi hunter. And uh, me and uh, the Mexican president, the former Mexican president, Vicente, Vicente <laughs> Fox, uh, we shoot Trump's plane out of the air with a, a land-to-air missile. Wow. And okay. him and Putin parachute down. And you can't tell who lived through the uh, the, the, the messages of, of D. Militant are <laughs> not responsible for uh, DC radio. Uh, <laughs> it is a comic book, ladies and gentlemen. So but uh, we're not advocating violence. You no, know I mean it's a comic book. It's, yeah, it's a comic it's book. It's a comic mm -hmm. book. Yeah, go knock on his door. Don't He's please don't come knock on my door. I ain't got nothing to do with it. Okay. Well, it's been out for over a year. You know, it's been out for about three years. So if you was gonna knock you on my door, you can knock by now. You don't live in D.C. We live in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I know y'all so, in D.C. You were nominated <laughs> for an Emmy for your uh, Joan Rivers documentary. That's dope. I yeah. Joan Rivers is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite female comedians. Mine too. Mine what too. Um, like? What was she like? Well, I went to the Comedy Hall of Fame, and um, I'm one of the curators. Actually, I'm the first Black curator they had. Is that uh, right? I bought in Robert Townsend. I bought in Franklin Ajay. So I'm involved in a lot of projects, but I'll be honest with you, On I met Joan Rivers in the airport briefly. For this particular project, they had me, I was I was traveling a lot, so they had me do what they call curating. Mm -hmm. They would call me up and ask me stuff, make connections, do this, that, and the other. Uh, we're doing a project right now. Same thing, the Comedy Hall of Fame is on the East Coast. I go there periodically, but I'm not always there, but I'm a phone call away, and they pick my brain because the Hold on. Check, check, check your mic. This out. Right now, I'm foremost expert on comedy, period. There's only three comedy historians of note. There's Mel Watkins, who wrote On the Real Side. You might have seen that book. It's got Richard Pryor on the cover. He's sitting yep. there picking his nose. Yeah. Um, there's a guy named Cliff Nesterhoff, who did a book called The Comedian. So he deals a lot with white and Jewish comedy. And he even mentioned some of the stuff from my first book in his book. Mm -hmm. And then you have me. Um, I have three historic comic books, uh, comedy books, uh, yep. Black Comedians on Black Comedy, Comedians, Laugh, Be a Lady, and this latest one, uh, This Day in Comedy, The Ethnic Encyclopedia of Laughter. Nobody has that kind of trilogy at all. Where, earlier in the show, where can people find the books? Amazon.com, or if you want to see all of my books under one roof, just go to a, on one site. Go to funnylit.com, F U N N Y L I T.com. Gotcha. Y'all get that. Go to Funny Lit and go to Amazon to find all of those books. Right. So you'll see all eight books at Funny Lit. Yeah. You have to kind of search around, you know, at Amazon. Okay. So, okay. So we're going to work on that. But I um, wanted to, this, the, the latest book, This Day in yes. Coffee, right? Yes. What was the inspiration behind that book? Because, uh, you know, it comes off as like um, uh, a bunch of factoids that we need to kind of remember. It's like, oh, you forgot about this. And oh, you forgot about this. And oh, you forgot about this, you know. And so you were able to get some insight to stuff that, you know, you kind of knew the surface of some things, but you delved right. in a little bit deeper. So what was the inspiration to uh, to to bring that about? Um, well, after I'd done black comedy and I'd done a book on female comedy, which is which was deep doing that, because uh, I didn't know that women went through all the stuff they did in comedy, even though I'm a comedian around comedians. Talk about um, that when you finish. Lord you know? Do I address that? Yes. <laughs> OK. Yeah, y'all go through a lot uh, more than that. Finish, finish, and then go back to it. OK. Um, what, what inspired me to write the other one was uh, that it was kind of the next logical step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk yeah. about female. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was kind of the next logical step to deal with ethnic comedy. Because when I did Black Comedians on Black Comedy, that was 2006. You did not have the rise of the Middle Eastern comic, yeah. Um, because you know we had nine eleven and you know, two, that was two thousand one, and then and you know Middle Eastern comedians, whoever they were at that time, were kind of pushed underground. And then you had that resurgence uh, with the uh, what was Axis. I'm trying to remember that. 
Um, and, you know, then you have the people like the Season Sorry coming out and uh, Maj Joe Brani. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of them, uh, Shappy, Corsandi. They all came to the forefront. And I felt that they needed to be uh, get their moment in the sun, as well as Black comedians who I didn't feel like I gave enough information on. And then, like I said, 15 years had passed pretty much between books. So you had a lot of Black comedians who were mentioned or had been interviewed to talk about other comedians. For instance, somebody like Dion Cole uh, had a low profile in 2006. Well, by 2019, mm -hmm. this guy had done five TV shows. Yeah. Right. Right. So he had made history. So a lot of people had made history. Some people had passed on. So I really wanted to get into that. I wanted to deal with the TV shows that had gone. Uh, nobody had ever dealt with a lot of the uh, Latin uh, TV shows or I had Latin comedians. This is this was a point. I had Latin comedians after black com uh, comedians come out and asked me, would you help me write a book, Latin Comedians on Latin Comedy? It's like, I could help you. However, it's not going to be authentic if I do it. Because you're not Latin. Yeah. I'm not Latin. And so I won't know the inside of why certain people. Now, I can write about them from the surface, which I did in this book. I can write your bio. I can give you all that. But here's the beauty of this book, and I want to point this out. Um, every At the end of every uh, story or entry, there's a link. So if you type it in, for instance, if you type it, if you're reading about good times, you type in the link. Now you can watch an episode of Good Times. Wow. Same thing for Dave Chappelle, Chappelle Show. It really doesn't matter. Uh, Patrice O'Neill. You want to see Patrice? There, you read his bio. Now let's see why he was funny. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you, oh, he was funny. That doesn't mean anything. And we're in the uh, 21st century. We are in the age where that can be done. And I am a black man, and I'm glad I'm saying this on DC uh, yeah. radio, that um, a black man came up with that because I checked it out. Yeah. And I've been around That's since right. it came out. Nobody has ever done that before. So That's right. And so if you have the digital version, it's like having a 500-thing uh, entry documentary and on comedy. It's amazing. Nice. That's yeah, glad I came up with it. So, um, <laughs> so okay, I. the people the people didn't catch the website, your website, where they can see all the books, which is the F U N N Y L I T, funny lit, L I T, like in literature or little tongue. Okay, okay. So you have um, you have done so much on the history of comedy and delved into so many aspects of comedy. I still want to circle back to your, you know, you, the, what you found out about women in comedy mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about that. And then I still have another question. Of course. Okay. Um, I co-wrote that book, uh, Comedians Laugh, Be a Lady. And I co-wrote it with my wife, who was a comedian. And the reason for that was, well, number one was his or her idea. It's like, well, why don't you do a book on female comedy? And um, shout out Tuesday. Oh. <laughs> yep, shout out to Tuesday. <laughs> and uh, it was her idea, and it was a great idea. So I had her do the actual interviews, and then I did the writing. You know, we transcribed <laughs> together and all that. But I knew that women would tell her more than they would tell me. I don't care how much you liked me or respected mm -hmm. me or whatever, there's that sisterhood. And I, that's what I wanted her to get. And she got some really great stories. One story was about a female comedian who had, um, she had checked into the hotel and she had went and taken a shower. She came out of the room and the promoter was sitting there on the couch talking about, hey, you want to go to the mall? You want to go watch a movie show? Well, how did you get in here? And he quickly, calmly explained that, well, you know, I'm the one that paid for the room. So they gave us two keys, uh, a key waiting for you. So I, got, I had the other key. So many stories like that. No really? guy yes. has ever experienced that, to my knowledge. Yes. No, I've not. never heard a male not. comedian say, yeah, I walked in, man, and, and, and the homeboy was sitting on the couch talking about he wanted to take me shopping. Like if yeah, homeboy no. would have been out the window. Yeah, early. If if you, we can't have fun, then you might not get the rest of your money. What? Yes, they tried all yeah. kinds. Stuff. Yeah, they do that That's to women. Why, I should be liked more then. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, um, you know, when when you go on the road, like folk, most female comics, if they're not represented by agency or some sort of representation, we want to book our own rooms. Uh, we don't want you booking rooms. Don't book yeah. nothing for me. I, I'll well, take you know, all of that. 
Cheryl Underwood used to go on the road packing. Yeah. Sherry Shepard told yeah. us that story. Her and Cheryl, <laughs> Sherry Shepard and Cheryl Underwood worked together one time. The guy didn't want to pay. Cheryl uh, pulled a gun out of her purse and said, oh, no, you're going to pay me. And that's, that's when right. Sherry Shepard said, uh, that's when I went into acting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't want to have to pull out a gat every time I go to do a gig. No, you don't want to have to go through none of that. And then you're in those little towns and you don't know what's what. And, yeah. you know, the promoters mostly were men. So yes. you you kind of at their mercy. B flat, she said she she won't even go eat with them. She don't do nothing. She come do the show and that's it. Yeah, and that, that makes that, sense. That's my big sister. So she we I mean yeah. she, she be straight. Boom. Yeah, like that's that's you know, um, you have to. Uh, I want I I know that you've had some. Uh, crazy roast you've been on the road with just about everybody right so you know yeah. from stand up yeah. perspective um i know like me and alex scott we we hopped in the car and we would drive 14 states in two weeks we yeah. would just hit it and just like we yeah. out there we uh, so where where um what are some of your favorite uh times on the road um i had a good time me dl hughley and courtney g my, this is how oh. we bonded. We were in Atlanta. This is ages ago. And that's how we all kind of became friends. Me and Courtney were nobodies. We were broken. Dio was just busting through. Mm -hmm. And so they had put us together. And um, Dio said, you guys hungry? It's like, well, yeah, mm -hmm. man. But you're <laughs> trying to like, you know, measure this money. You ain't trying to run out. Dio ran out to the store, bought a chicken. And he made us chicken fajitas. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, nice. You know, that's yeah, Dio Hughley stuff right there. Yeah, yeah, no, that was that was very cool. Yeah, right? chicken right? it, boy. Y'all some that'll black stretch, Mexicans, right? That'll some, stretch. Y'all some Blexicans. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, I, yeah. I was on the road with Cedric the Entertainer a number of times. Um, one story I can tell uh, is uh, we were at the hotel, and he's Cedric the Entertainer, and I'm D. Miller Todd. And so we didn't know each other's real legal name. So when you check in a hotel, you know, you check in under your real name. Uh -huh. So we wanted to hook up during the day. So he's asking, so um, uh, <laughs> what room is D. Militon in there? Well, what's his last name? He said, I don't know, Militant. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know, Entertainer. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Did, did I, how did, did he find funny. you? We had to wait till the show. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Cedric is a fun guy to be on the road with because yeah, if people don't uh, do anything like people in the service industry, if they don't do their job, Cedric will do it. We went into a restaurant and we weren't getting no service. Cedric went That's and cool, grabbed man. the menus and just put them on the table and then acted like he was going to take the order. So what y'all want? You you want some of this smothered? You want some of this smothered beef? You want some? So he would do that until the real workers would kind of be, I guess, shamed into doing a job, and would come and work. Oh, that's funny. That's hilarious. I'm gonna start doing that. That's Being on the road with those cats is really fun. Yeah. I, I yeah. work with DL. I, I got one more Cedric story, real quick. Great. Cedric and I. It was me, Cedric, and Shucky Ducky. We're in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we did the show. Show was cool. After hour, they had an after hours joint, so we went to that. And somebody started shooting. So me and Cedric duck, threw the table down, ducked behind the table, and we were looking for Shucky. So we made the bodyguards, the handlers, whatever. They got us out to the van, and they they're trying to whisk us back to the hotel. And we're like, well, "What about Shucky, man? What about Shucky?" It's like, "Man, there's too much shooting going on. We got to go." <laughs> so they get us back to the hotel, and we we talking about Chucky the whole way. It's like, man, this ain't cool. <laughs> you know, no yeah. comic left behind. Yeah, you ain't supposed to leave nobody behind. No comic left. Right, right. So we go bad, and we get back to the hotel, which had to be four to five miles away. When we got back, Chucky was there. He had <laughs> ran, but when the pop pop. Shucky, Shucky was like, gone. Man, how did you know? Oh, you well, he valued his whole life. You hear me? Shucky was there like, what happened? <laughs> what took y'all so long? Right. Y'all okay? Pops. I didn't say for this and pops. I heard one pop and I was out of there. He, out. he said he ran the whole way. That's funny. He ran the whole way. Yeah. That's right. That, that's when you want to live. That's when you got, you know, I yeah. want to live. Okay. So well, they keep shooting that bullet ain't going to catch me. Yeah. Let's talk about the Encyclopedia of Laughter. Okay. What I haven't read it, and I'm 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 going to now because I'm super intrigued. But what sort of 
stuff makes you want to write an encyclopedia of laughter. That seemed like it would be such a fun work. It was. It took five years to do. Wow. Um, it only took five years. It probably should have taken two or three, but I had cancer for two years. Wow. Yeah, so that kind of slowed you down. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, sitting in seven hospitals, that'll, let me, that'll, yeah, that'll let me go tear fight. your time a little bit. Let me go fight a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah let me fight for my life for a while. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, if I live, then I'll finish this book. Uh, yeah. yeah, I had 17 blood transfusions, uh, two rounds of radiation, five oh, procedures, wow. uh, one operation, uh, gross stuff. So, um, yeah, it, it took a lot of time, but every comic or everything in there usually has an interesting story. For instance, Tommy Davidson, one of your, D, one of your DC brothers, uh, Tommy Davidson, when he was 18 months old, his mother, his biological mother, put him in a dumpster mm -hmm. and left him. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, a white woman found him, yep. got him, took him home, cleaned him up, raised right. him. Raised him. Raised him. Yeah. Got him through school, college, all of that, you know, whatever. That's right. Made him the man he is right now. And yeah. somebody left an 18 month old in a dumpster. Yeah. That is, that's evil the way I see it. Do so you, that's uh, an interesting story. Um, Christina, Christella um, uh, Alonzo, who is the first Hispanic female to have a show named after her on a network, uh, which was ABC, Christella. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, she, her family was so poor, they were raised, uh, were, grew up in a diner and abandoned one of those old diners that was abandoned. Wow. And she wow. slept with her mother in the same bed till she was 18 years old, which obviously wasn't popular with any of the local boys. Mm. Wow. Do you find that um, like the funnier, the comedian, the darker the history? To a degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like Robin, Robin Williams was extremely troubled, but he was one of the funniest people to ever do this. Oh, my goodness. I mean, Richard Pryor. It's your prime right. example. Your prime, right? You can't get you can't get a darker yeah, upbringing. Like, yeah, you named the white dude. He's like, nah, yeah, Richard man. Pryor, Richard darker. Pryor. Don't be doing. Yeah. You gonna do dark? You might as well go. I mean, with yeah, Robin had, had yeah. mental yeah. issues and all that. Yeah, yeah. But Richards, all of that came from outside forces. Yeah, from yeah. the time, from the place you were raised to right. the way you were treated. He had right. people would put cigarette. He had cigarette burns on his back. A lot of people may not know uh, that. Yeah, yeah. No. So people were treating him like a subhuman. But yeah. yet he still rose and became, you know, probably the most, uh, the funniest. I will say Ever. this. I think Richard Pryor was the funniest comedian of the 21st century. Do I That's think he right. was the greatest of all time? That's no. Right. <laughs> no. You, you don't think he's the greatest of all time? I would put him as the second. I'll tell you why. Right. I, I, when, when I say the first, it may blow your mind. I would say George Carlin. Everybody. I'll tell you why. why. Please tell me why. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you why. Richard Pryor was like the Beatles. George Carlin was like the Rolling Stones. The difference is the Beatles had a hot 10 years, even less. Um, Richard Pryor, when you think about it, only had a hot 10 years because after he burned himself, we got into diminishing returns. He really didn't get over until 19. We knew about him on records from 1969, maybe until 1972. But as far as movies and other projects, that's 1974. Pryor did not gain mainstream acceptance and push until after he won that Grammy writing on uh, Lily Tomlin's album. Right. And, George and that's Carlin. when the industry, because uh, mm -hmm. Trading Places was a Richard Pryor project. He was supposed to have starred as the sheriff, but because he was on drugs and he was a big enough name at that time to overcome that, so they would just, so the studio would say, well, we'll take the chance because we know of the box office. Um, he ended up writing on Blazing Saddles and he recommended Cleavon a little, but he couldn't get it. Same thing with uh, 48 Hours. That was Richard Pryor. What? They ended up giving it to Eddie Murphy because of drugs. Um, same thing with uh, uh, Trading Places. That was also supposed to be Richard Pryor. But once again, drugs, Eddie Murphy got it. So, you know, the deal, uh, Eddie Murphy owes his career to drugs. <laughs> I know he's like that's Eddie Murphy like look go ahead send another bag over there and uh, <laughs> let me, you know, yeah, yeah. make sure Richard you know, make sure Richard's covered this sure that, Richard's clever, that, that is clever this like um, those are some of my favorite films like you know and Richard is yeah. my number one yeah. so how do you get to George Carlin being number one there we go okay I'll tell you why because as brilliant as Pryor was 
think about his range as far as the stuff he talked about, which was mainly within his experience. He didn't live for us to well, Richard Price material developed with him as he got older. With George Carlin, we saw a lot of reinventions. With Richard Pryor, we saw the that one reinvention. He went from being like a, a Bill Cosby clone where he was on those early black and white shows and he was, you know, doing all the motions and the faces and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he became the Richard Pryor who was cursing a lot, who cursing selectively and brilliantly, who we all knew. But then when you look at George Carlin, he started like Lenny Bruce wearing a suit. He was a button down comic. Maybe he was talking trash, but mm -hmm. he was a clone basically of Lenny Bruce. Then he went to that hippy dippy weatherman thing, which was later in the 60s with the hippie movement. He gave you the seven words he couldn't say on TV. And then once he started doing HBO specials, that's why I say Carlin, because if you look at every Carlin HBO special, yeah, he stays within his age frame and yeah. he talks to you from that point of view yeah he doesn't talk down he's talking from a man in his 40s his yeah. 50s his 60s and 70s all the way up until he expired he was still hitting and he was coming current he yeah. wasn't talking about no hey i remember when nixon was president no no he was always current and he was always relevant so okay. if you look in a time capsule maybe 40 or 50 years from now i think the time will bear out that i'm correct because yeah. carlin gave you more of an overview of the human condition than prior did gotcha yeah. I do not disagree with you about Carlin's range, but I think that Richard Pryor had more of an impact because he was black and he had uh, less advantages as George Carlin, who was a white man and probably likely less troubled. His life, his drug addiction and all of those things were a direct result of, you know, his life, his, his life experiences. And those are the things that hindered him. But despite those things, this cat was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. I'm not, I'm not saying prior wasn't. No. I'm just saying on an overview from a historical standpoint, I think, and see, I said this a long time ago. I said this maybe four or five years ago. Other polls are now saying it. So and, George Carlin, yeah, 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 yeah because yeah. Pryor heard, was always I, number one, and Carlin was heard. always number two, and just yeah, about every poll you ever had, I agree. until recently, right? I agree. So, how do you feel about Lenny Bruce? Lenny Bruce is one of my inspirations for wanting to be a comedian. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a Lenny Bruce movie, uh, it was a uh, Lenny Bruce movie with Dustin Hoffman, and Right after I saw that movie, I went and got a book on Lenny Bruce. Mm -hmm. And I was still a musician. I wasn't really thinking about doing comedy. I just like the fact that Lenny Bruce, what he had done was went against the grain. He didn't, he started as a hack. Comedy. Right. He started he as a hack. impression, telling hacky jokes and all that. Mm -hmm. But then one night he decided just to be him, who he really was. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the first comics to do that. Most comics, even the ones I liked early on coming up kind of hid behind a certain comic right. persona. They had a stick. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, take my wife, please. I take my yeah. wife everywhere. Yeah. She always finds a way back. Right. And that's funny. Oh, yeah. man. Take but, my wife, please is the funniest one line ever, though. Please. Take my yeah. <laughs> please. You know, it, to that, to <laughs> that <laughs> end, no though, I think that the, the best person to do those kind of stick jokes was uh, Roger Danger Rodney Dangerfield. Oh yeah, was yeah. Oh, he's one of my favorites too. Yeah. Yeah. He's funny. It was for me. I love Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. I tell Rodney you, I tell you my, my kids go to a private school and they won't tell me where it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 oh yeah. man, I yeah. loved him. Yeah. So let's see. Um, you 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 ready for your next? Question. Do you have another question? Go ahead. Okay. Do you so <laughs> in the climate in the climate of today's comedy. Um state of black comedy. <laughs> what um what specials in 2019 uh up till today, what mm -hmm. were 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 um groundbreaking uh in your estimation? <sighs> Sticks and stuff. Funny, just funny. Yeah. Oh. Um, I mean, Dio had a funny special. Uh, yeah. Michael Shea had a funny special. Um, Bill Burr always kicks funny stuff. Yeah. Um, some more special was all right. I, I, and she brought, uh, I don't remember if hers was 18 or uh, 19. 
I love uh, it. Wanda. Uh, uh-huh. But to me, Sticks yeah. and Stones was the yardstick. Because oh. that's, to me. Sticks and Stones. That was to big. me, Sticks and Stones was like uh, Bring the yeah. Pain. Mm-hmm. You're kind of throwing out your best stuff and you're unapologetic for you, mm-hmm. for it. And, you know, they took Dave off of a lot of uh, polls or a lot of uh, things that he was on. Well, we're not going to let you vote for that and this, that, and the other. And that's ignorance. And it's historical ignorance. Because if a comic can't say what they want to say and the public supports it, who are these gatekeepers to try to tell the public or dictate uh, what your taste should be? Okay. Some people got offended by some of the things you said, but that's that's life. That's life of a comic. If you don't say things that offend people right. when you're trying to break that ground, so to speak, or push yeah. that envelope, yeah. then years later, you just be remembered as this nice, safe little comic. I was watching a That's Patrice fine. O'Neal video. Patrice O'Neal yeah. said that comedy, good comedy is is, you know, with the audience reaction, 50% um, laughter and 50% of shock. Like, you know, comedians should be like unapologetic and the best comedy that a person yes. can, can offer is that that makes you like that's thought provoking. Right. You and should that, leave there thinking about something that's right. beyond and, and, just, wow, that was funny. Yeah. Okay, well, tell me what he said. Yeah. I don't remember, but it was funny. Right. One of my favorite DL jokes is the one about his dad. Now, DL um, talked about his father having Alzheimer's and his sister telling him, you know, you need to come see your father. He said, well, he can't remember nothing. She said, nah, we'll tell that mf <laughs> I just left. <laughs> I'll be back the same time tomorrow. <laughs> that I was there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That and... Uh, um, Dave Chappelle, when he talks about the white guy who killed himself, the white guy, I can't remember his name. Andrew Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. And yeah. then he goes into the story about the cat who grew up with him and <laughs> ruined his life. You and know, his life goes down. He said, I uh-huh. tried to talk him into killing himself. He said, no. oh, man, I think he I'm hanging said, And this dude never thought to commit suicide. You know, <laughs> That's not the black way. Then, exactly. No, no, we're gonna tough it out. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, it, it just may get better. <laughs> yeah. It just may get we better. We're gonna take it day, day. Okay. Right. Shoot, I still got three toes. <laughs> my right, get, right. Exactly. I get a discount on my pedicure. I mean, you got brothers that been in prison for 40 years. They ain't thinking about killing themselves. No, no that's no. the last they still trying to get out. When they get yeah. out, they get an ice cream truck. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> 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 that's what's going down <laughs> um, okay what would you like to see in stand up comedy going forward from this point we have a new generation there are younger comics coming up what would you like for, for them to see you know comedy has gone through so many different changes what I would like to see it go to the next step uh, we started off as minstrels and then you know we were doing the servant thing and uh film, that's how black comedy, and then when we finally got into stand-up, you see the different phases of it. We had to, you know, you had your Nipsey Russell type of stand-ups, and your George Kirby types, and then you had Dick Gregory who came with the political, and then you had Cosby with the family stuff, and then Pryor with the social and the political. Um, And then, of course, we all tried to follow the Cosby thing, but then once you had the, um, the, the mainstream comedy boom, and then you had the black comedy boom, and then once the kings of comedy came, then you had everybody had to be group going out in groups and tours like that. The next step is already here, which are the internet comedy shows. Is Alice Miller and DC Youngfly and some other brothers are doing it. They're doing it like a live podcast. So yeah. that honestly will probably be the next step, which is really a throwback to what um, the Rat Pack did, even though they weren't comedians. Yeah. It's, a bunch of people on stage being funny. It's, it's kind of improv. It's kind of mm-hmm. stand up, mm-hmm. but it's, it's and it's very interactive with the audience. Yeah. So if that is the next place it goes, that's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that because okay. comedy Spe- should never try to stay like we had the movie Dolomite. Rudy mm-hmm. Ray Moore started as a party record uh, performer. 
Just yeah. like Red Fox did party records. Uh, LaWanda Page, Slappy, uh, Slappy White, Leroy and Skillet. They were all on party records. Right. And then they would go out to clubs and stuff, do the tour of the Chitlin Circle, and they would tell jokes. Jokes. Jokes that we could all, anybody could go back and tell. Some of them repeated each other's jokes. Yeah. Um, so when you started with the self-confessional comedians like Pryor and Lenny Bruce, uh, it just needs to go to the next step. It should not I, yeah. I, I did some uh, shows in Atlanta over the summer and I ran hey. across a lot of guys that were at, just kind of stuck in the time machine because hey. I'm known for the Comic View era. I produced Comic View for five seasons and I was on it. So I'm kind of known for Comic View and these guys yeah. are like, man, we need to bring Comic View back. And I'm the first one to say, no, we do not <laughs> because hey, D, hold Comic on. View hold was on. a hold thing on. of its time. Hold when hold it was on. there, it was there. And you'll <laughs> never have, just like Def Jam, you will oh, never have that oh, flow oh, coming oh, in. Oh, oh, Daryl, Daryl, we one got time. one minute. We one, got sixty no, no. seconds. Look, 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 real quick. <laughs> we gotta have you back on because this yes, is crazy. Yes, you got two. so much. Okay. Yeah. Will so, you come back? Yes. Okay. Anytime. So look, where can people hear your podcast? Um, okay, go to Morris Media Live. Mondays, it'll be 5 p.m. your time because it's 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Morris Media Live, and you will be able to see D. Militant got a show. We just had some great guests on. Uh, we've had a lot of people on. We've had um, had Melanie Camacho on there. I've had yeah. uh, Joey Medina on. I had Howie oh, Bell on. That was fun. We had Howie Bell. We had uh, Joey. just yesterday. I think we had we had Alonzo Bolton on just uh, yesterday. Nice. Ellis. So nice. we going so we definitely going to please tune in to uh, Daryl Littleton's uh, podcast. Um, it's called it, the podcast is named after your wife, right? No, the pod, that's the old one. We did one oh. back in 2012. This okay. one is just mine. <laughs> okay, I got yeah. greedy. So got this one's called D. Militant Got a Show. D. Yeah. Militant Got yeah. a Show. D. Militant All right. Got a Show. You guys have been tuned in to Backstage Thank Beyond the Labs. So Thank you for coming on. Thank you all for watching. This Thank you guys for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Oh my God, I can't wait to talk to you again because I just got to hear everything the encyclopedia has to say. This is Nikki Moore on behalf of my main Apple scrapper, Eddie, Br Eddie Bryant. Hello. I just want to say thank you. Tune in, buy his book, and watch his podcast, the, the newest book, This Day in Comedy by D. Militant, Daryl Littleton. That's right. <laughs> uh, this is Backstage Beyond the Laughs on 90. 6.3 96 HD4 HD4 DC Radio DC Radio Thank you. So Saturday midnight tune in We'll be back That's 9 o'clock your time D Thank you very much Thank Back you. stage beyond the laughs We out cheer Bye Daryl Bye Thank you Nikki Thank you, Thank you Eddie. We're going to call you to come back next week <laughs> Okay let's do it I'm in town next week Okay good I'll keep the sun up Thank you Bye. Bye-bye. All right. We're off. Yeah, you got people Thanks. looking at us like they're about to fight.